Welcome to iOS 9 iPhone and iPad app development lesson 3 Swift 2.0 collection types. In this section we're going to take a look at the different collection types in Swift and we're going to understand how to use them. So mainly we're going to be talking about arrays, dictionaries, sets, and while not an official collection type we're also going to include tuples and by the time we're done you're going to understand how to decide what collection type is right based on your data's needs. So let's get started. So up to this point we've been talking about properties that store single values. So variables and constants that store a single value. But now we're going to talk about collection types and collection types allow us to store multiple values within the same variable or constant. And first up is the array. So it's time for our tech info byte on arrays. Arrays store data in a zero based index. Arrays are the most common collection type. Arrays store data in the order that it was entered. And arrays can store any data type, but all entries must be that same type. So if you create an array and the first entry is a string, the rest of the entries must also be strings. Okay, so we're going to take a look at arrays in more detail right now. Okay, so we're talking about arrays, and arrays are one of Swift's collection types, and they're probably the most common collection type. So first I want to start out by showing you how to create an empty array. So basically you create a variable, and you give it a name, and we'll say names, and then you say equals, and an array goes in between square brackets. So since this isn't going to have any values in it, we're just going to say that it's going to contain strings and then we're going to activate it. Okay. So now you see on the right hand side that evaluates to an empty array. So there's nothing all that special about an empty array, but we can now say names equals and add some names to this. So we'll just add a couple names just to populate this with some strings. So I think three is good enough. So now one thing right off the bat about arrays are you get some interesting uh, functionality with them. So the first thing you can do is to see how many items are in an array and you do that by saying the array name dot count. And then you'll see on the right hand side it'll show how many items are in that array. Now there's three items in that array but it's uh, something you have to keep in mind is that in that that arrays are indexed at a zero base. So technically, Jason is at index zero, Christina is at index one, and Mikey is at index two. So if we wanted to get the value of one of those, let's say we wanted to get uh, the value for the first index not the very first, not zero, but the actual number one index, then we would say names and we would just say one. And then on the right hand side, it'll show you what that value is. Okay. Now the thing about arrays are you can make an array of anything. So we could create a variable and call it numbers and we can make an array of integers this time. but it can only have integers. So as soon as you put the first item in there, then you can't have something different. So I can't say 2.0 because that's a double and I'll get an error on that. I should be getting an error on that. If I say 2.01, it still doesn't give me an error, but you're not supposed to be able to do that. If you start out with an integer, it must remain an integer. Just consider that an Xcode glitch. So whatever an array contains as the first value, all the other values must be the same thing. But on an interesting note, arrays don't need to um, contain just basic um, items. So they don't need to contain, you know, values that are basic like integers and things like that. So I could make an array called colors and I could set that equal to an array of UI colors and just activate that 
And then if I wanted to add colors to that, I could say colors is equal to, and then add a color to it, like a UI color dot red color. And we could do a UI color dot green color, and so on and so forth. So it doesn't have to be just um, basic things that you put into there. But okay, now we know that an array can contain pretty much anything. We know that once you put what it's going to contain, that it must continue to contain that and only that. So how do we add to an array? Well, basically what we would do is there's a couple different ways to do it actually. And one way is to say colors. And then we could say dot append. And the new element, obviously since this is in the colors array, has to be a UI color. So we'll say a gray color. And that will add the gray color to the colors array. Another way we could do this is we could say colors plus equals and then add something into here like a UI color dot yellow color. And what that'll do is that'll add the yellow color to the very end, just like the append does, but it's just a different syntax. Now another way we could do this, and I'm going to add to the names array this time, is we could say names dot insert and the new element, in this case, since it's going to be a string, we could put as Bianca. And we need to say what index we want to put that at. And I'm going to put that at index 3. So now you'll see that the names array on the right hand side has four entries in it. Okay. Now, if you wanted to see what's in an array and you're in a playground, obviously, then all you need to do is type the name in and it'll come up on the right hand side. But if you're in a program and you want that to print out to the console, then you just go ahead and print out the array. And that'll print it out just like an array would. Now, you can also iterate through arrays using a simple for loop. So we could say for name, and name is just a word that we made up. We don't have to use name, we could say for x, but name makes sense for name in names. Then do the following, and I would just print a line item that says the name is, and then we'll pull out that variable name. And then once that's done, that'll go through four times. And if I make a little room here, and we hit this, we can see the result, at least the last result in here. If we want to see all the results, we could look at the bottom, where it shows the name as Jason, Christina, Mikey, and Bianca. Okay, but we're going to get rid of that. So quite a few things you can do with arrays. Arrays are pretty simple to understand. The thing to keep in mind is that once a value inside an array is set, it cannot change. So it's almost like setting um, a regular variable, where if you set it to an integer, it must always remain an integer. So if you set an array of integers, it must always be an array of integers. Okay. So that really is the long and short on arrays. But because I had that Xcode glitch there, I just want to demonstrate here, if I try to add a 2, that that's not going to take it. It should give me an error. And that's because it's expecting a string and it can't convert an integer to a string. Although that technically can be done, but it's not going to do it for you. Okay. So just to demonstrate that. And this syntax here where we're accessing the array and then the index number is very common. And we'll come across this quite often as we need to access things in an array and um, at a specific index location because this will tie together with things like table views it'll tie together with things like um, you know certain statements in an array that we need to pull out whether we need to pull out a random uh, section of an array or we need to pull out a specific index in an array so that's really it on arrays 
but you should take some time and play around with arrays a little bit before you move on because arrays really are the building block upon which we're going to learn dictionaries and sets and even tuples. So go ahead, play around with arrays a little bit, become familiar with them, understand how to interact with them. And um, oh, also, the only thing I didn't show you is if I wanted to go ahead and erase everything in the names array, I would just go ahead and set it equal to an empty array. And then our names array would have no names in it. Okay. And that's also something that you would do commonly when you're iterating through something at the very beginning. If you're adding things to an array at the very beginning, you might want to wipe the array out and then start adding things to it. This will all make sense to you a little bit more as we go along through the course. Trust me. So become familiar with arrays and we'll see you in the next video where we talk about dictionaries. So in this video, we're going to continue talking about collection types, but we're going to focus our attention on the dictionary. And dictionaries are similar to arrays in the way they're formatted, so the way their syntax is. But from there, they kind of stray off. So let's move into our tech info byte for dictionaries. Dictionaries store data using a key value pair. Once a key or a value has a type associated with it, the rest of the entries must follow the same format. And dictionaries do not store their data in any particular order. And they also return their data in a random order. So some things to keep in mind as we talk about dictionaries, which we're going to do in a playground right now. So dictionaries store their data using a key value pair system. So in that regard, you can think of them as a real dictionary, as if the word was the key and the definition was the value. So I'm going to start out by creating a couple dictionaries here, empty dictionaries, and we'll call this one items. And we're going to make that of the type dictionary, which just looks like an array to begin with. But we're going to say that this is going to have a string as a key. We're going to put a colon and we're going to say it has a string as a value. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set this equal to an empty dictionary, which syntax looks just like that. And you'll see on the right hand side that that's an empty dictionary. Now, if I create it in a different way, I'll get the same result, but it's a little easier this way. So if I create a products dictionary and I set that equal to, let's say an integer and then a string. And then I just go ahead and activate that. Then you'll see that has the same effect and that's just an empty dictionary as well. But like 99% of the other items in Swift, you don't need to actually declare that something is going to be a dictionary as we just did. If you declare the values at the same time that you declare the variable. So I'm going to create what's called a dictionary literal, which just means that I'm literally giving some values to the dictionary as I create it. So I'm going to create one called states and this is going to be a string string dictionary so I'm going to use the abbreviation for the key and the value is going to be the full name of the state and to add an additional one you just put a comma and then you follow that same format so if we add New York and then that would just be New York. And we'll add another one in here just for good measure. So we'll add California. Okay, so that's a dictionary literal, which just means, as I said, that we're creating the values as we create the dictionary. Now, if we wanted to add something to the dictionary, so if I wanted to add something to the products dictionary, I would just type in the name of the dictionary. And then, sort of like an array, I open it up like this and I say what key I want to assign. And then I set that equal to whatever it's going to be. So in this case, we'll just say product 1. And that's at the key of 123. So it kind of looks like an array there. 
but I'll show you the difference if I add something to the items array. So if I say items, and then I want to add item one, and I'm going to set that equal to item one. Okay, so you see there the difference where items is going into and it's indexing, it's looking for the key of item one. And when it gets that key, it returns the value on the right hand side of item one spelled out. Okay, now if you wanted to get the value of something, all you would need to do is type in states, let's say for example, and then put the key in. And on the right hand side, it would evaluate to New Jersey. Okay, now there's also um, other ways to update keys. So if we wanted to update something in here, let's say we wanted to update California and be a little clever and spell it differently, then what we could do is we could say states dot update value, and the value that we would put in would be the state name and the key is going to be the actual abbreviation and you'll see that on the right hand side it returns California spelled correctly but if we pull up states you'll see that it's not spelled incorrectly because that's the behavior we're looking for so you see CA California and something else to note is that California is last in our dictionary but it's returning first here in our playground. And that's typical behavior for a dictionary because they do not return values in the same order that they are entered. Now, like arrays, you can also use the states.count function to find out how many items are in a dictionary. And if you wanted to delete something from the dictionary, so let's say, you know, we got tired of the California thing. We could say states, and then we pull up the index that we want, in this case CA, and we set it equal to nil. Okay, now mind you, this is not the same as setting CA to nil. What this is doing is it's actually removing that entire key of CA and the value of California completely out of our dictionary. So if I now pull up states, you'll no longer see California in there at all. We just have the two states there. Okay. Now, interestingly, if we want to iterate through a dictionary, we use a, what's called a tuple. And we're going to be talking about tuples in a couple of videos, but one use of tuples is iterating through dictionaries. So the way we do that is with a for loop. I would say for, and the way it works is you used to say key and then value. And you don't need to use those words in states. And then you open it up and you do whatever you'd like. And in here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do just the print line and we're just going to pull out some of these values here. So we'll just say key is short for value. And you'll see that that does that two times. And if we look at it, an example of that would be NJ is short for New Jersey. So that's how you iterate through it. Now, like I said, these don't have to be key and value. This could be something like abbreviation and state name. Of course, now I need to change that here and here. But you'll see that that doesn't affect it. It still does it the same exact way. So you make up these names as you develop your code. And to be quite honest with you, there's not a whole lot more to say about dictionaries, but we will get into more detail about dictionaries as we move forward because we will be using them quite a bit. So just go ahead and study this example here.
come up with a couple of dictionaries of your own, put some items in, take some items out, and uh, understand dictionaries. And next, we're going to move on to sets. So we're still talking about collection types. This time, we're going to talk about sets. Sets are fairly new to Swift. They were introduced in Swift 1.2, and it's now time for our tech info bite on sets. Sets are very similar to arrays in their syntax. In fact, they're so similar that you must use a declaration whenever you create a set. Sets store unique values. Duplicate entries are not counted. And sets were introduced in Swift 1.2, but they have been in Objective-C for quite a few years. So let's take a closer look at sets. So sets are unique in Swift in that they're one of the only basic types that you need to declare as a set when you actually declare your variable. But there is a good reason for that. And the reason is that they look identical to an array. So first I'm going to show you how to create an empty set. So we'll create a variable called teams. And that's going to be of the type set. And that's going to be a set of strings. And we're going to set that equal to an empty set. So you'll see the syntax there is identical to an array. So if we didn't have that type declaration, there would be no way to differentiate that between an array or a set. And sets are new to Swift but they've been around in programming for quite some time and sets only store unique values and I'm going to demonstrate this quickly by creating an array of ints or integers I mean a set of integers and I'm just going to say that this is going to be a set and then I'm just going to create it here so I'm going to say one, two, two three, four, five, and that is our set. But if you look over on the right hand side and compare that to the left, you'll notice that although I included two in there twice, two only appears once. And in fact, if I call up ints and do a count function on it, then you'll see that it only has five entries even though I literally put six in there. Okay, but what it does is it discounts any duplicate entries and it does not return those. So this would be good for something like a user login system where you need unique usernames or unique email addresses or something like that. Um, it would also be good for, you know, any type of account system. So you couldn't have duplicate account numbers. Um, you know, so there's there's possibilities for sets and they bring up new uh, opportunities as a developer to create different logic in your code based on the way a set reacts in regards to uniqueness of the values, okay? So I'll show you a different, couple different things on here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create another set. This time I'm gonna call it my bills. And this is going to be a very lengthy set because I have a very large number of bills. But we'll just narrow it down to some of the main ones. So electricity. And water. And internet. And rent. And etc. etc. But now let's say, you know, as it always happens, you get a new bill and we want to add something to the bill. Then all we would do is say my bills dot insert. And then we put the item that we want to insert. So now I need to pay for my cell phone. So now I just put that into that set. Now, how do you remove something? from a set, well that's just about the same way that you put it in, except this time you say my bills, 
dot remove and then you remove that item so let's say my landlord now pays for water so I'm gonna go ahead and remove water okay so I no longer pay for water so now if we wanted to iterate through a set we do that the same way we iterate through an array so I could say for bill in my bills and then we could just go ahead and do a print line and in here I'll say I cannot afford my and then we'll pull out the bill and then we'll see what that looks like by clicking the little plus sign over here so I cannot afford my internet so one of the many things I can't afford but I'm forced to pay for it anyhow so let's say we wanted to clear a set out there's two ways we could actually do this so we could say my bills and we could just set that equal to an empty set or what looks like an empty array or we could say my bills dot remove all and that would have the same effect okay so as you can see sets could come in handy in certain circumstances but arrays for the most part are going to be more popular dictionaries are going to be more popular sets are going to be kind of the third selection for you but depending on your apps needs sets may be just the thing that you're looking for so we're going to wrap it up here on sets and in the next video we're going to talk about tuples which technically are not a collection type but as you'll see they act like a collection type so that's why I'm including them here so I'll see you in the next video okay so we're still talking about collection types but we're going to talk about tuples and that may seem a little unorthodox to you because tuples aren't an official collection type in Swift but I'll explain throughout the video why I think it's important that you understand them now and why I think it's relevant while we talk about collections okay so let's move on to our tech info byte on tuples tuples are not an official collection type tuples can store multiple value types in one instance and tuples are meant to help create and pass around data quickly and easily so I'm going to show you how that works coming right up so to start this discussion off I'm going to create a variable called produce and this is going to be a dictionary and it's just going to be a dictionary of products basically so we're just going to put a couple items in here so we'll say one two three is bananas two three four is pears and three four five is apples And uh, I'm just going to leave it right there at that because that's just there to serve as an example, something to work off of, so that I can show you what a tuple or one of the intended uses for a tuple actually is. And we've seen this before. So in order to iterate through this dictionary of produce, what we would say is for, and then we would open up a tuple basically, and we would put in whatever we'd like. So we could say skew. And then product here and then we would say in produce and then we would open up our loop and put whatever code that we want in here in this case we're just going to do a print line so I'll say the skew for and we'll pull out the product is and we'll pull out the skew and I'll just close that print line off and then you'll see it does it three times on the right hand side and that's just a quick way to go ahead and assign variables that we can use to identify the key and value within the dictionary but tuples weren't designed just for that and in fact you can create a tuple like I'm going to here 
and I'm just going to call it tuple one. And a tuple is in between parentheses. So you put your values in between the parentheses and you can put any type of value in here. So I can say Jason and I can mix that with a double if I'd like and an integer and a Boolean and whatever else I'd like. Um, and you'll see that that has absolutely no problem storing multiple value types in one instance. So in tuple, we have a string, a double, an integer, and a Boolean. And you can't really do that in other collection types. Now, why would this be useful to you? And the main reason this is useful is in functions, and particularly in returns on functions. So I'm going to create a function, and I know we haven't gone over functions yet, but the syntax of the function isn't all that important yet. But I'm going to create a function called get car details. And that's going to return a tuple that's going to have a string, an integer, and a Boolean. And I'm just going to open up my function here. And to make things simple, I'm just going to create a couple variables here. One that is a string. So I'm going to say let name equal, and we'll just pick a car here. So we'll say a Jeep Cherokee. And then I'll let our speed equal 120. And then I'll say, um, let is convertible equal false. And then we would return the tuple as we said we were going to. And in here we're going to return the name, the speed, and is convertible. Okay, now, like I said, you don't need to understand what the function is and how this all operates inside here. The important thing is that this is the return on the function. And we're going to return a string, an integer, and a Boolean. And aside from using a tuple, we can't do this any other way. So down here, I've returned a string, an integer, and a Boolean, as I said I was going to do. Now, how would we use that? One way we would use that is we would say let car equal get car details. And then you'll see on the right there that it has some dot syntax going on. So we should be able to access that using the dot syntax. So if we say car dot zero, then you'll see that, that comes up as Jeep Cherokee. And car dot one comes up with the speed. And car dot two comes up with whether or not it has a, um, you know, convertible top. But that's not actually all that useful to us either. So there's a better way we could do this. And we can create our own variables for this. So we could say let, and we can come up with anything we want in here. So we could say car name, and then um, top speed, and convertible, we'll say. And we set that equal to our get car details return. And then what we're able to do is actually pull up car name and you'll see on the right hand side that it's assigned it the value of Jeep Cherokee and we could do the same thing for the other three the other two and we can also just do a print line off of this now using those variables if we want to so we could say the and we'll pull out our car name so the car name can go at least, and we said top speed, and you'll see that that has no problem just pulling that out and using those inside of your code. So you'll see these a lot in completion handlers for built-in functions. 
and you'll also use these a lot for iterating through dictionaries. But I wanted to make sure that you were aware of their availability and knew how to use them early on. This way, a lot of times you're not sure what to use as a return type. And if you need to return more than one value, it might seem a bit confusing, but you can just use a tuple. So, and uh, you may hear people call it tuple, 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 tomato, tomato. Really doesn't matter. Um, the whole point is that this is available to you. And it's probably a little bit underused in Swift so far, but I see that changing as I look at more and more code. So that's it on tuples. I wanted you to be aware of them. I wanted you to know how to use them and know what they're capable of. And um, we're going to move on from here. And actually, we're going to move on to functions. So this will all become pretty clear to you if it's not already. All right, so we'll see you in the next video. Welcome to iOS 9 iPhone and iPad app development. This is lesson four, functions. And I think you're really going to like this section because functions are going to be the first part of code where we'll actually see the code doing something instead of just declaring variables. So let's get to the lesson objectives. In this lesson, by the time we're done, you're going to understand what a function is and what it does. You're going to be able to write functions that reduce the amount of code that you need to write overall. You're going to be able to make your code clean and concise with the help of functions. And you're going to be able to recognize when a function could help in your code. So that's what we're going to be talking about in the next couple of videos. And as I said, I think you're going to enjoy functions. So let's get to it. Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about functions and I'm going to introduce you to them. And we're going to find out what exactly a function is, how to use it, how to write it, and when it should be used. So let's switch to our tech info byte for functions. Functions are modular, reusable bits of code that help you perform tasks repeatedly without the need to write the same code over and over. Functions are written once and then called from within other parts of your code to be executed. Functions help keep your code clean, concise, and readable. And functions, when used properly, can save you a lot of code and a lot of time. So let's dig into some functions here in the playground. Okay, so I'm going to start out by creating a simple function. And I'm just going to call that hello. And it's not going to take any arguments or return anything. And all this function is literally going to do is go ahead and print hello there and then that's the basic makeup of a function that's how a function looks now once you've declared a function as we just did in order to call the function in your code you just type it out and you call it with those parentheses okay now that's all well and good but that function just prints a line to your console so that's kind of pointless so let's create a better hello function so I'm going to explain the syntax this time so you start out a function by using the func keyword and then you give it a name and I'm going to call this better hello and then inside these parentheses you put any arguments so here I'm going to put an argument that I'm going to call name and that's going to be a string. And then I close off my parentheses. And then we make an arrow using the hyphen and the greater than symbol. And here's where we specify a return type. So this is going to return a string. And then we open up our function code block. And this is where we put our function uh, code in. So what this function is going to do is it's going to return a string that's going to say hello there and then we're going to pull out the name that was provided in the argument above and let's show you how this works in the code so if we want to go ahead and call this better hello then we just start typing in better hello and you see that it's telling us that we need to put a name in that's going to be a string so I'm going to put that name in and I'm going to say class. And then you'll see on the right hand side there, 
what it does is it returns the string hello there class. So you can see a bit of functionality there. So this is probably the first time that our code is actually doing something. But we can do um, a lot better than that. In fact, functions can have properties. Functions can have functions within them, which would be called a nested function. Functions can perform all sorts of logic if you'd like. So let's create another function. I'm going to call this function average score. And this function is going to take something that I'm going to call scores. And the scores are going to be an array of doubles. And then we'll close that off. And then what we're going to do is we're going to return a double from this function. We're going to open up our code block. And now we can actually write our functions. So in here what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some variables. So I'm going to create a variable called total. Which is going to be a double. And I'm going to initially just have that set to zero. And I'm also going to create a variable called count. And that's also going to be a double. And I'm going to set that to zero. And then what I want to do is I want to take the array that's coming in and I want to iterate through that array. So I'm going to say for score in scores and open that for loop. And what we're going to do is we're going to say total plus equals, I did that backwards plus equals score. So basically what we're doing there is we're saying that we're going to take the total and we're going to add score to it. And then what we want to do is increment our count. And then after this for loop is complete, then what we're going to do is we're going to actually return the calculation of total divided by count. Okay, so let me show you how we would call that. And I'm just going to put some more space in here. So if we call average score, it's asking for an array of doubles. So we're going to put that in. So we'll just put some scores here. These would be test scores. And what we should get on the right hand side is an average of those scores. Okay. And that's going to be returned in a double value. I find it hard to believe that that actually doesn't have a decimal value. So I'm just going to put another one in there just to see. Okay. So there we go. It is a double value. Sorry about that error. Okay. So that's our average score function. And you see, we can put a for loop in there. We can put functions in there. We can put properties in there, which we've done. And if we say that we're going to return a double here, then the return value must be a double. So keep that in mind. And in general, you didn't see it as I was creating this function because I had written doubles accidentally. But you'll get an error until you actually return what you said you were going to return. So we said we're going to return a double. And until we actually go ahead and return a double, we'll get an error in our function and it won't be a valid function until that's complete. So let's move on to another example. So in this example, I want to create a function that does a little bit of logic before it returns a value. So I'm going to create a function using the func keyword. I'm going to call it get area. And it's going to take two arguments. One is going to be the width which is going to be an integer. And then if we need to set another argument, we put a comma. And this is going to be called length, which is also going to be an integer. And we'll close that off. And we'll put our return arrow. And we're going to return a string. So we'll open up our function block. And the first thing I want to do is make a variable called area. 
and I'm going to set that equal to an empty string. And then I'll move this up a little bit. And then what we'll do in here is we'll create an if statement. So we'll say if width is equal to length, then what we're going to do is we're going to return the string that says the area is, and then what we'll do is we'll pull out these values, but we'll compute them. So we'll say width times height, length rather, and you're really not going to see the value in this unless I say the square is, because now in our else statement, what we're going to do is we're going to return the area is, and we're going to do the same thing, and we're going to pull out the width times the height length, rather. Keep making that mistake. Okay. So now, down here, if we call get area, and we put a width in, and we'll just make it simple, two. And if you hit tab, you'll go over into the other input area, and we can put another amount in there. And it'll say the area is 10. Okay. Now that's because it's just an area. It's two by five. But if we say get area and we call it with the same values. So if we put four in and four, then it says the square is 16. And, you know, we could be a little bit more descriptive in our, in our statements here saying the square is 16 inches or feet or whatever the case is because we didn't really specify but that is just an example showing you that you can perform uh, some type of logic before you return a value now the other thing is in here I didn't actually set area so this really is not needed so we can take this out because I decided to just return the string rather than setting the value to area and then returning area. Okay. But I'm going to show you an example of how to do that. So I'm going to create a simple function here that's going to multiply some values together and return a string as a result. So I'm going to say func and we'll call this multiply. And that's going to take a number one, which is going to be a double and a number two which is also going to be a double. We'll close that off. And we're going to say that we're going to return a string here. We'll open our function block. And let me just move this up. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to declare a variable called result. I'm going to set that equal to an empty string. And now I want to put a little logic into this multiplication. And it's just simple logic. And I'm just going to say if number one equals zero or number two equals zero then we're going to let result equal the string um, any number multiplied by zero is zero and then otherwise we're going to actually perform the calculation. So we're going to let result equal the string that has all the values in it. So we'll pull in number one and we'll say times number two is, and then we'll pull out our number one times number two to get our actual result. And then at the end of the if statement, outside of it, before we close the function, we want to go ahead and return result. Okay. 
So now, when we call this, and I want to show you something when we call this, you'll notice that when I say multiply, number one colon double is all highlighted. And that's because the first argument doesn't need a name when you're calling it. So it's expected that the name of the function will be good enough for you to understand what's supposed to go there. But in reality, when it comes up, it shows what's supposed to go there anyhow. So you just put your number in. And we're going to tab over and put another number in. And then we should get our result on the right hand side, which is clearly something we couldn't do in our head. Now, I just want to be clear that we don't really need to use um, actual numbers. We can use variables in these spots. So if I let A equal 56.7 and I let B equal 34.8, then I can call multiply and use A and B as the arguments and that will evaluate just the same. Now, one other thing I want to mention is scope. And scope uh, means when something is available to you to use. So in other words, when we declare A and B out here, then they're available to use anywhere. But in here, I declared result. And result is not available outside of the function. Okay, now we're returning the value of result when we call the function. But I can't just go ahead here and say, uh, give me the value for result, because it just doesn't exist, okay? So that's just another thing to keep in mind, is the scope of the variables within a function, okay? And I'm going to end it here on functions, and what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about error-throwing functions, okay? So I'll see you there. In this video, we're going to talk about error-throwing functions. So as of Swift 2.0, there's a new way to handle errors, a proper way, and we do that through error hand error throwing functions. And um, we're going to go over all the specifics about that in this video. Now, there is a lot of new material and new concepts in this video, so please pay attention to the parts you're not familiar with. And let's move into our tech info byte for error throwing functions. Error throwing functions are just like regular functions in their syntax with the addition of a throws statement. Error throwing functions can be used alone to handle errors or used in conjunction with enumerations and switches to handle errors more elegantly. And when called, an error throwing function must be called with a try statement, generally within a do try catch block of code. So we're going to find out what all that means coming right up. Okay, so in order to understand error throwing functions, there's a couple things that we need to familiarize ourselves with. One is the guard syntax, which is generally called within a function. Okay, so in addition to that, we're also going to need to just briefly touch on enumerations. We're going to have to get into the syntax for the error throwing function itself. And we're going to have to take a look at the do try catch statement. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. And the first thing I want to show you is the guard syntax. And as that's generally called within a function, we're going to create a function. And we're just going to call this greeting. And that's going to take something called person. And that's going to be a dictionary a string string dictionary okay and then we're not going to return anything in here we're just going to have this as a function itself so let me explain how this guard syntax works basically you say guard and in this case we don't have a variable variable to work with so we're going to create one so we're going to say guard let name equal the person array and we're going to try to tap into the person array at the index of name. And otherwise, what we're going to do is we're just going to return. Now, 
after the guard statement, we're going to go ahead and put our print statement. And we're going to say hello there. And we'll pull out the name. Okay. So now when we call this function, you'll see what I'm talking about. So if I go to call greeting, first it's telling me that I need to put a dictionary in there, a string string dictionary. So we're going to do that. And we know it's actually going to look for one with the key of name. So I'm going to put that in there. And the name is going to be Christina. Okay, so then when we call that, what it does is it prints the line, hello there, Christina. But had this not been correctly named name, if we had names in here, then that print line would have never happened because we're returning right after we can't assign the variable because it can't dig into the uh, dictionary under the key of name, okay, because it doesn't exist. We didn't provide that. So if we provide that, then our guard statement goes through. Our else statement never goes through, so we never return out of the function. And we do our print statement, okay? So that is basically how the guard syntax works. So next, what I wanna do is to create a couple of variables. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a uh, function that withdraws some money out of a bank account and in order to do that, we're going to create a variable for bank balance. I'm going to make that a double. And I'm going to set that to $1,000. And then we're going to create another variable called bank is available. And I'm going to set that equal to true. So that's just going to tell us if the bank is online or not. Okay, so now we have those two variables. Now you'd think we're ready to actually write this function, but really in order to handle an error throwing function, we should have an enumeration of the error type. So I know we haven't gone over enumerations, but basically an enumeration is just a list of selections that you can make. And in this case, it's gonna be a selection of errors and specifically banking errors. So we're gonna go over enumerations later so I'm just going to type out a quick enumeration, and that's done with the enum keyword. And we're going to call that banking error. And it's going to be of the type error type. And we're going to open up our enumeration and make two cases. One for insufficient funds. And another case for bank not available. Okay, so don't worry too much if you don't understand what the enumeration is. Just understand that with that enumeration, we can choose from insufficient funds or bank not available. Okay, so I'm going to create some space here because we're going to write a function called withdraw. So we'll start out with the keyword func and we'll call this withdrawal. And it's going to take something called an amount, which is going to be a double which is basically the amount the person wants to withdraw. Now here's where we would return our type, our value. So what we're going to return on this function is the new balance. But because this is going to throw an error, we need to put the keyword throws here. And then we put our return arrow. And then we say we're going to return a double. And we'll open our function block. Okay. Now we need to use the guard statement in order to throw our errors. And we want to do that before we actually do our function logic. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check if the bank is available. And the way you do that is we write guard. And then we're going to call up our bank is available um, variable. And if that equals true, we're OK. Otherwise, what we want to do is throw an error and that's going to be a banking error dot insufficient funds. Okay. So then we need to go ahead and account for the fact that uh, actually that's not the insufficient funds one that we want. 
we want the bank not available one there sorry but now we want to account for the fact that there may not be enough funds in the bank to withdraw so we'll create another guard statement and we'll say guard um, bank balance is greater than amount which is the amount we're trying to withdraw and if that's good then we're okay otherwise we're going to throw an error and it's going to be a banking error dot insufficient funds okay then next in our actual function we're going to actually create the rest of our function now so the function the bulk of this function is just basically taking the bank balance and setting that equal to the bank balance minus the amount and then returning the bank balance okay so I know this seems a little code heavy already but wait there's more um, now in order to actually call a function that can throw an error correctly you need to do that with a try statement and this is where our do try catch syntax comes in and this sounds more complicated than it is but basically you say do and you open a code block and what we're going to do is assign a variable at this point called new balance and we're going to set that equal to us trying to go ahead and withdraw and we'll say $150 and if all is good then we can go ahead and do our print statement here and we'll just say your new balance is and we'll pull out our variable for new balance okay now that's if everything is fine but if we have errors which we know we may have potentially two different errors if we have errors we need to catch those errors so we need to actually say catch and then what we want to do is we want to catch our banking error and we want to specify which one so our banking error dot insufficient funds and I'm not sure why it's not auto typing but it does this every now and then and if we have that error then what we want to do is we want to print a statement saying that there's not enough funds in the bank there are not enough funds to perform this withdrawal okay and this happens a lot at the bank I mean at least for me it does okay so then we need to account for the other error which is the fact that the bank is offline so we're going to catch that banking error and I just need to see what that was it was bank not available So when we catch that error, we're going to do a different print line. And we're just going to say, sorry, could not connect to the bank. Okay. Now those are the two errors that we're aware of. But as you know, you can't predict every error. So we need to account for the fact that there may be an error that we're not aware of. So we're going to put a catch statement in and we're just going to print a line saying that an unknown error occurred. Okay. So that is how we actually call our function. See, really all we're doing is we're saying try withdraw 150, but then we're putting all these catch statements in in case we have errors and we're going to print out um, print out different things 
depending on what the error is. So if we can't connect to the bank, let's just change this um, to false for bank is available. Then it should catch that error. And it did. And it says, sorry, could not connect to the bank. Okay, so I'm just going to turn the bank online again. And now I'm going to try to withdraw $1,500 out of our 1000 And it says there are not enough funds to perform this. Okay, so as you see, the error handling works actually quite nicely. It's just there's a lot involved in it. And don't worry if you don't understand it all at this point. Because as I said right at the beginning, there's a lot of new material in here. And we are going to go over the guard syntax and enumerations in a future video. So don't be um, too put off by all the coding that's available or all the coding that's required to throw an error and catch it. Because once you get the hang of it, it's really, um, really becomes second nature. Okay. It's just right now it may seem a little overwhelming because we're talking about enumerations. We're talking about guard syntax. We got this whole new do try catch thing going on. All right, so just study this as best you can. If you don't fully understand it, I suggest you continue and move on. If you do get it, great. Um, but if there's something you're not quite getting here, just move on because we're going to see this um, in our code as we continue the course. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video. Okay, in this video we're going to talk briefly about closures. And closures are basically a function that does not have a name. So let's go to the tech info byte on closures. As I said, closure is basically a function without a name. Technically speaking, closures are referred to as a closure expression. And all functions are closures. So there are closure expressions, named closures, and nested closures. And uh, we're going to touch on those right now. Okay, so I want to introduce you to the concept of closures, and closures are a function, basically, or technically speaking, it's the other way around. Functions are a closure. So there's three types of closures. You have a named closure, which is basically a function. And then you have a nested closure, which is a function within a function. And then you have what's called the closure expression, which is basically a block of code, similar to a block of code in C or Objective-C, that you can pass around and it basically acts as its own function. So to demonstrate what a closure is, I'm going to create a function here. And I'm going to call this function sort names and it's going to take two names both of which are going to be strings and it's going to return a boolean and the boolean is basically just going to return whether or not name one appears in the alphabet before name two so is name one less than name two and alphabetically speaking that would be does it appear in the alphabet before or after so if we call the function sort names and we put a couple names in here like Mikey and then we'll put the name latte in here then that evaluates to false because latte comes in the alphabet before Mikey does so to demonstrate what a closure is, we need to go to this function up here, and I'm just going to comment out the sort names call here. And in order to turn this into a closure, what we would do is we would completely delete this and replace that with an opening curly brace. And we would replace this curly brace with the keyword in. And this is what a closure looks like. And basically, you're going to see this when we talk about 
processing data and responses from the web because they all use closures and you capture return values in here and then you process them after the in keyword okay so I'm not really going to show this in depth because it's just going to serve to confuse you because that's what it did to me when I was first learning Swift but we are going to go over this later when we go into sorting JSON data and XML data and things like that and closures will become a lot more clear to you because right now just think of a closure as an unnamed function and we're going to run into closures throughout the frameworks and that's when we're going to deal with them okay because right now it's just going to confuse everyone so we're not going to talk about closures in depth right now I just want to show you the syntax on how a closure is built and it uses in keyword and it basically is the function it's a function that just executes itself in a block using the surrounding code but further than that I'm not going to go I'm going to wait until it makes sense in context so that's going to be it on closures for right now